the Todd Shapiro Show. More shoes today for you. Oh, and they're nice. Yeah, they're nice shoes. <laughs> Are you wearing socks? No. Are you wearing those little uh, sockets? No, I'm not. I have no sockets. Should I be wearing sockets? You know what? Uh, if you look at the most stylish people, they wear sockets. I don't wear sockets. I can't find them. Uh, but uh, a lot of a lot of very stylish gay men always have sockets. I'm like, where do you get those? It's a secret. <laughs> it's a specially held secret, not for me. So my shoes just end up being thrown in the garbage every four months. Get, did they get smelly? Is oh, that why? Eventually, like really yeah. great shoes take longer, but. Uh, like the worst shoe is the, it's like a canvas. It's like a docker or a sketcher. It's like a rounded toe kind of deal, like a van type thing. Yeah. They always end up stinking in a month with me. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Terrible shoe. But a good shoe won't smell so much right away. A really, really good shoe can last you, uh, well, you can't wear it every day, but if you wear uh -huh. it, say once a week or once every uh, five days in the summer, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it can last you two years. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's like, it'll, it'll wear out before it stinks. Is it, do, you, do you ever have, have you ever got a shoe fixed, or are you just at a point you just throw them out and get a new pair? So I have a I have a bit of a shoe problem. Do you have a shoe addiction? Uh, a little bit. No, oh, it's yeah, a little bit. Fucking crazy, Brad. Yeah, That's yeah. cool. Yeah. So I have about uh, 150 pairs of shoes. Wow. I have shoes I've never opened up out of the box. What size are your feet? I can borrow some. I'm like, a, a, I'm like 11, half 12. Hey, hey, hello. Is that who you are? <laughs> yeah, we park our cars in the same garage. <laughs> Although your car is a lot nicer than mine. But <laughs> Yeah, I used to go, uh, there was a great Browns in Hazelton Lanes. You know, the, the Hazelton Lanes is now called something else. And it was underground. It was the best Browns in the world. Just like killer shoes. They, had, they because it was a spe because it was in Yorkville. It was special. They had like, you know, they had for women. They had uh, all the best brands, which they don't care anymore. And for men, they had phenomenal brands. And uh, Fabi is a good brand. I love that. Pachati is another one that I love. And I would go and buy, you know, eight pairs of shoes. I could like I take my <laughs> wife, but I couldn't be like I'm just going to buy all the shoes for me. So I'd always, you know, buy a bunch for her. So we get like ten pairs each. Wow. Eight pairs each. Yeah, I, I want to yeah. be your next wife. <laughs> You're not That's, pretty enough. No, I don't. I did not <laughs> think so. And the wrong sex. <laughs> right. um, so, I, I mean, I don't mean to get too personal, but I have to ask. What, what, what would uh, Brad J. Lamb say at the most expensive pair of shoes he's ever bought? And, you know, you can tell me that off, you know. So, one trip, I, I when I went to London once with uh, Katrina, who's my ex, um, we went to a Louis Vuitton uh, so, uh, somewhere in, in central London. And this was the year that Louis Vuitton had the best fucking shoes for men ever. Uh, they still have good good shoes, but not. This was like one year where they hit it perfectly. And I bought seven pairs of shoes at Louis Vuitton, and one pair was two thousand dollars. That's the most I paid for a pair of shoes. Two thousand. But these were <laughs> these shoes. I tell you, these shoes yeah, yeah. had a stainless steel capped heel. Oh. I still have them. I wear them a lot. They're they were like they were a patent leather. Just in case anyone's shooting at your Achilles or something, like. You know. <laughs> well, they just sparkled. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. The like patent leather. The, 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 describe the story. The so they're patent leather. Yeah. They were very pointy, very stylish. They had a, a stainless steel wrap around the heel. It wasn't a high heel. I like kind of lower heels because I'm tall. Okay. And then and then they had this kind of like uh, little gray specks, like little uh, kind of stars or sparkles. They say, it sounds tacky, but it was very subtle, and. Uh, Every time I wear those shoes, people are like, my God, those are fucking beautiful. They're great shoes. A lot of people point out shoes. You, you've told us that before. Like, you, a lot of people will notice a nice pair of shoes on a man. You know, won't they? women will know. A lot men don't have great taste in shoes generally. Okay. A lot of guys have that kind of slip on shoe with a caveman kind of square off toe. That's kind of the standard go to guy shoe, you know, with jeans and an untucked white shirt. That's kind of the uniform for guys. Yeah. But, but uh, if you wear a nice pair of shoes, women stop me all the time and say, they don't say anything about me, but they say, <laughs> I love your shoes. They're great. You're yeah. too tall. I can't see you. You're, I guess. You know, just looking at, they're just they're looking at maybe the right area. But it's funny. Women do notice gay men, obviously, are very stylish generally. It's a generalization, but I find more gay men to be stylish than straight men. And, and, uh, and women obviously care a lot about style and clothing. And they notice those small things. They really do. Women notice a lot more than men think they notice. And they like men who are, they like their men to dress well. 
Do you, is it ever too late for do you think for a dude to, to like you know I'm 43. You, you think one day if I just start wearing super nice blazers all day long and styled my hair instead of wearing ball caps, like is it is it okay? Like can, can that just happen one day to sort of change your persona, or, or is that point you're trying too hard? No, a hundred percent. Like I've seen you out. You 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 clean up very well, and even when you're wearing stuff like you are now, you're stylish in your way, right? Like you are. Russell Peters so, gave me the shirt. That's why it is. It's yeah, in the back. Sort of <laughs> But no. yeah, I mean, if you started doing that, uh, I think it's never too late to try to change. I actually try to, I actively try to change uh, myself about every 10 years, like a massive sea change in who I am and what I'm doing just to challenge myself. Huh. Would you ever, maybe you should go with like a, a huge, like blonde wig or something next time. <laughs> <laughs> when the next maybe, decade. <laughs> maybe I'll get, uh, maybe I'll get uh, the, the soon or now you can, you can clone hair. Uh-huh. So maybe I'll get cloned hair and oh. massive rock star long hair. It would freak people out. Whoa, do they have that <laughs> now? Really? I, 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 believe it or not, I met a uh, oh. Korean company that owns worldwide rights to a lot of cloning technology. Oh. And they contacted me because they want to build uh, private hospitals for, they have a thousand people that are a part of their private hospital group. They're all, a lot of Middle Eastern people, very wealthy people, and they build them in private areas across the world. So I, I had a parcel of land they wanted to do it on. So I met with them. And they can clone anything, man. That exists already. I, I'm, I'm, they can clone a liver. They can clone your hair. And you just have to put it back in and it's there forever. Wow, I've heard of two-tier medicine, but not like, you know, not, not rock star tier. Like that's, that's, that's when you know. <laughs> this is the kind of stuff that upsets people if they know about it. But it's, there, there are people that can have anything they want r- replaced. Anything. Well, not their brain, but how much yeah. would like a clone liver cost? Uh, you know what? We didn't get into the the costs of that stuff, but they they um the the they only have a thousand members. They showed me one of their their hospitals, and it's it has everything. Like basically, you 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 know you you live in this. It's like a massive sprawling hotel gated, and there's a hospital complex there. They give you a pager, and your doctor's in direct contact with you whenever you need to do something, and you just wow. wander into the uh, the the hospital area and they'll take care of you. But yeah, they'll, there's a huge incidence of uh, diabetes uh, um, among certain parts of the wealthy population in the world. Mostly, there's a big problem with that in the Middle East with very wealthy people. And uh, so, you know, there's, there's certain organs that need to be replaced when you're diabetic and, 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 uh, and, and the diabetes has progressed uh, to a certain point. And I, listen, they're telling me stuff. I'm like, come on, really? They showed me a full presentation of what they do. Yeah. Oh my. Uh, God. At that point, it becomes like a fine cigar too. Like, Yo, I got this liver. Like you know, it's 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 a pride thing. I think <laughs> you know, like you talk about it. If you could go and get it, why not? Oh, <laughs> if man, you have that kind so of money. Funny. I just imagine if, if if I was rich, people would be like, "Is that your wife, Brenda? <laughs> she looks is no, yeah. She that's Brenda. She's twenty one now." <laughs> 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 well, you could have various ages of Brenda. You could yeah, have, yeah, yeah. You have a daughter age Brenda. Yeah. Oh, that's all gross. Can't yeah. do that, all the way up, man. All the way up. Starting from maybe 20, yeah. 20 to 50. Yeah. You have a hen pecking Brenda. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, tr- uh, TorontoCondos.com is where uh, Brad J. Lamb is at, uh, doing sun- so much great stuff across Canada. From Edmonton to Ottawa to Calgary, uh, obviously what he's done in Toronto is mind blowing. And go and check out many of his projects, including Theater Park, which we hopefully will have a cool announcement for uh, coming up in next week. Uh, and 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 again, TorontoConnells.com for for any information or investments or buying condominiums or homes. Uh, Brad always comes in and talks about uh, what's going on in, in the world of obviously of real estate, and and it's 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 like a weekly feature that is important for everyone to continue to understand. Canadian banks have recently asked to undergo a additional stress tests when it comes to their policies on mortgage lending. Uh, the Bank of Canada apparently has warned of increased riskiness as a run-up in household debt po- uh, potential and consequences for these lenders. Is, is this is this true? Is this something we got to worry about? What, what's going on here? Well, listen, um, debt is a problem if you can't manage it. But I think I think this is a mountain out of a molehill. I really think that um, that uh, economists who who sort of ring the warning bells are not looking at the underlying information. So to break it down, uh, 165 or so percent 
is the number of uh, debt versus your your gross income. Okay, so meaning that if you make a hundred thousand dollars a year, the average person has one hundred sixty five thousand dollars of debt. Now, if you wow. if you make a hundred thousand dollars a year, you're going to probably buy a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar apartment, which you could easily afford with no difficulty. None at all. I could go through the numbers, but trust me, no problem. So if you're if you're going to buy a three hundred fifty thousand dollar condominium, you probably have you know if you're saving and and put a good down payment, maybe two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of debt. So automatically, when you buy a home in Canada with that kind of equity, a hundred thousand dollars down, which is about a third of the purchase price, which very few Canadians do, they would have a two hundred and fifty percent ratio, which blows the doors off the one sixty five. Now, mm. if that guy has no other debt. He doesn't have a car, no student debt, no credit card debt. And no just, ex-wife. No ex-wife. <laughs> That's all he has. Is that guy in trouble? No. That guy's doing smart stuff. So the problem is that you can't look at the number. You have to look at inside the number. So another idea or another comparison is you take a guy who, say you take that same guy, he's making hundred grand a year, he's $250,000 mortgage, there's no other debt. Okay. Then you take a guy that makes $100,000 a year, and let's say that property costs fifteen hundred dollars a month to own. Then you take another guy that's renting, paying fifteen hundred dollars a month, and uh, he doesn't have a mortgage, but he has a car, he has credit card debt, he has student loans from his education, and uh, maybe he's got a line of credit. And that guy has a hundred thousand dollars of debt, so he's got less debt. He's under that one hundred and sixty-five percent. He's at a hundred percent. The other case is at two fifty percent. Who's better off? Well, well, credit card debt's at 24%. Um, student debt is, well, people never pay that off. It's, I just you know. did two weeks ago. It was all for lap dances too. <laughs> so my parents paid for the education and I just applied for it. And That's then, good to know. Yeah. <laughs> good to know that tax money. Okay. You know, and, 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 then, and then automobile debt is also stupid debt, right? Yeah. So, so the, so the, so, and, and that guy still has to pay $1,500 a month rent. So case A is paying $1,500 on his home and every month he pays off $400 of his mortgage and that's all the debt he has. And the other guy's got a car, credit card, student debt and line of credit and he's still paying $1,500 a month. If that guy doesn't pay his $1,500 a month, the landlord's going to boot him out of the property. If you don't pay $1,500 a month to the bank, they're going to boot you out of the property. So why is the guy at 250 at more risk than the guy at 100? Mm. He's not. He's better off. So what, what this number has to, what has to happen with this number is we have to have the economists analyzing this look into the number and actually tell us where the debt is. And I've done this myself. And I'm actually commissioning in my office a full study on this because I'm very irritated about this constant pecking about this problem. And uh, I'm going to say that that 70% um, of the debt in Canada is mortgage debt. And mortgage debt's not a problem because you have to live somewhere. Mortgage debt's not a problem. If the mortgage debt you have is close to the cost of renting, it's not a problem. And something else, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to confirm this next time on the show, but I also believe that the average Canadian owns 50% of their house outright. That's pretty good. And I'll, I'll, I'm, we're also commissioning a study in the, in the G8 countries. So my office is doing a study in the G8 countries to see what percentage of people in those countries owns their home versus rented versus Canada. So if Canada, mm. if Canadians own 80, if 80% of Canadians own their own home and 50% of, of Americans do, we should have a higher debt ratio because we have mortgages. The mortgage is the big number that throws out a whack, right? And this is what these jerk off should be doing instead of scaring people that we have a problem they should be looking into these numbers on a because they're saying we have the highest ratio in the g8 or something like that and i'm going to prove we have the lowest ratio so next time i'm on i'll have that study done and we'll see if i'm right or they're right it's super fascinating actually and, and, it, and it's i mean it's just I, I think a testament to whether your brain works as opposed to other people's brains thinking that hey this is good debt this is good debt. you're 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 getting you know from what i know and i've done well in real estate you know the condo millionaire you can do I've been, I've made money every time I've, I've owned a property and there's been four of them and it's been great for me. It's allowed me to go up with each property I have. And as long as I think I can afford that mortgage that I have on it, which is probably a little bit high, um, I'll make sure that I'll pay it off. And if I get to a point where I think I might not be able to, then I'll sell it. Despite what anyone thinks the housing market may go up and down. I'll be ahead of that game. I'll be ahead of that curve. It, and, I, and sorry, Jay. Sorry. No, uh, don't be. Sorry. It's just so simple to understand what you're explaining that it boggles my mind that they don't, they're not getting it. Like, 
who, like, okay, who's better off? The guy with a $100,000 mortgage or the guy, like, that owes $10,000 to Boxcar Jimmy, the local tavern bookie? So that, that guy's going <laughs> to die. You owe $10,000 to Boxcar Jimmy. You're going to die. Do you know a guy named Boxcar Jimmy? I do. Yeah, okay. I don't know him anything because I'd be dead. We okay. wouldn't have this conversation. Yeah. It's, it's just, but, like, it's the same thing, though. And it's nuts that they publish these reports. And they're economists, and I don't know how you even get that job anymore because they seem so stupid well, to me half the time. Well, it's, if the world, yeah. this, this is the thing. The, the government in the world, or government media is all about scaring you. It's not about making you happy. It's about scaring you and keeping you off balance so you don't actually observe what they're really up to. That's the truth, man. Wow. Trying to keep us down? 100%. Fuck, that's sad. Well, we do it differently here. We call everybody out. <laughs> That's right. We call them out. We got Boxcar Jimmy behind us, too. We, yeah. we, he's, he's on retainer. Switchblade. He's on retainer. <laughs> uh, I, I actually saw this in the news earlier, and I, I was like, wow, I didn't realize. But they they today, uh, the city of Toronto, and, and this is going to sort of uh, speak to all of Canada eventually, has approved Uber with a public transportation company license, basically saying that Uber is the same regulatory framework uh, as taxis. And there was only like seven people there protesting too. It wasn't a big stink. A couple guys going, the shameful, that's a shameful. The three of them. Uh, it's a very interesting story and I, I wanted to get Brad J. Lamb's thoughts on it. So, um, you know, people won't ever complain if um, a new technology lowers their price of living. And so, you know, you can take an Uber to the airport for 40% less than a taxi or a limo. So why would you complain? Here's why it's unfair. So for the last, I don't know, however number of years, let's say 60 years, I'm just going to throw out there, it's probably around that time, we've had an organized cab industry in Toronto, right? And people have had to get a license, take a test, understand where everything is. Like the, I'm going to say that, that you know, it's not like our, tax driver, our taxi drivers are the most informed about streets, but they're better than they would be if they didn't take the test and study the streets, right? They're not yep. the London taxi driver, but they're better than a guy just jumping into a car and saying, where do you want to go? Um, they've also paid to buy a, a license. They've actually bought the license and stayed licensed and paid all those fees for all those years. And licenses traded hands. So if you wanted to own a taxi license, you had to buy it. And at one point, taxi licenses in Toronto were up around $300,000. Wow. And guys started buying them as investments, which which is perfectly fine. It was a, you know, you buy a taxi license, you you rent it to someone who needs it to drive a car, and the, you make a return. It's a little business, that. yeah. Supply and demand. There was only so many, so it's just, you know, I would have thought right. of that, yeah, right. at the time. Yeah. So, so what's inherently unfair is, is, is it, and by the way, I ride a taxi all over the city all the time. I don't, I don't drive a lot. And a lot of tax drivers know me because I've plastered my face around the city. So they're always asking me stuff about real estate. And I ask them stuff about what they're doing. And a lot of taxi drivers have done very well um, working their ass off, you know, multi-shifts. A lot of new immigrants. It's amazing, you know, in 30 or 40 years of eating it, what they've been able to do. A lot of them own their plate. A lot of them do, which means they have an investment that's worth $300,000. That investment now effectively really is worth zero. Who's going to buy it? Just, just get a, just get your your uh, your Toyota Civic. Uh, so sign what, on with Uber, and you're all set to go. So, Brad, will you not use Uber? I, I'll tell you what. I I don't have Uber as an app. I don't use Uber. Like my ex wife loved Uber, and so when she ordered one, I get in the car. Sure. But I don't support Uber as an institution or an organization. I think it's terrible. For all the cab drivers throughout the world, we're talking millions of people that drive cabs in all these cities, they just got fucked. Now, I'm, I come from it from the guy who saves that six bucks on a fare that would be 17 and now is 11, okay? I've had some great Uber drivers. I've had some crappy Uber drivers. I've had some great taxi drivers. I've had some great, great, uh, I, uh, some terrible taxi drivers as well. So, you know, give or take. Like the driver's not the, the service for the, that I care about. It's the actual price that I save. That is the only thing I cared about. The only thing I, I, I was surprised by with the city, and, and, and you see this now being approved in more and more cities, is that they, they it, it, I'm going to be careful. I say this. It felt like there was like a back end deal or something. You know, like for me, I didn't care because I was saving money, but I did see it as a business person who had this sort of regimen and all these rules that now all of a sudden is just gone. 
it felt like it could, could they be on the take on this type of stuff? Like, is that, is, that a, is that a crazy thought of mine? Well, I don't think they're on the take. I think that there's going to be more fees generated for the city because now Uber's going to have to pay. Before they paid nothing, now they're going to have to pay something. So there's, there's going to have to pay for, for uh, registering their, the, the, the Uber, but they're not going to have to pay the price of buying a plate, which is which fairly should be 300000 It was over a million in New York. You know, the, the, there's, there's actually credit unions in New York City and Chicago that are bankrupt now because they loan money on million dollar purchases for plates. So a guy would put $400,000 down, borrow $600,000, and their credit unions that were set up for the purpose of loaning money on taxi plates. It was a great business for 60 years. Those credit unions are bankrupt. They're done, finished. So, so I mean, do you look at this as from a purely kind of business level, from a fair practice level? Is, you know, ultimately, is, is that is that sort of why you, you see it? Like, like how can you... I get that disruptive industries, disruptive businesses are good. You know, they break down the brick and mortar and you got to keep up and advance and all this kind of stuff. But when there's actually rules in place and then all of a sudden you just switch the rules for technology, is that kind of the concern here? Listen, when when whale oil was used to light the cities, you know, in the 1860s, 70s and 80s, and then and then petroleum was found and it and all those whale companies went bankrupt that's just progress and good for the whales we're not killing whales for that stupid purpose anymore but this is a this is a business that's legislated by government and i think government owes a duty of care because they legislated i I think if it's a free business like electric car versus gas car you know or you know uh any any new any new massive change in technology that makes lives better and makes costs Uh, cheaper for consumers is good. But when the government is behind the administration and the licensing, they owe a duty of care to people that have spent their lives investing in it. And frankly, if I were those cab drivers, I would do a class action lawsuit against the city of Toronto. That's what I would do. It's very hypocritical, isn't it? I understand why they're doing it. Consumers demand it. Consumers want cheaper. It's It's a great service. It's very smart. It's fantastic. And the guy's so disruptive. I mean, the, the founder of it, but, but, you, no one's thinking about the taxi driver. And by the way, these are not rich people. Taxi drivers, yes. It's their livelihood because livelihoods are being affected now. And then what they're in, go, going to end up having to do, and, and it's weird because now I'm being hypocritical because I like the service because I save the money, but you're making me think of it on a more compassionate level, something I don't think I've ever thought before, is that these people are now are going to probably have to give up their tra- taxi license and become an Uber driver well, and earn half the money and then have this license now that's worth nothing. Well, what's going to happen is is that, so first of all, there are there, there's, people are going to say, this is bullshit, that the plates are in the hands of super rich guys. Like I think Mel Lastman has, I, I've read that he has many, many plates, but he might have sold them. And people say, well, who cares about that guy? Well, that guy actually took hard-earned capital and bought plates because the government was protecting industry. And and I think that that's something government has to think about. But a lot of the people that have a plate, are are, they have one plate and they're driving a cab. And those are the hardworking guys that save their money to buy a plate. They're getting screwed. And they can't go. They owe money on that plate still. A lot of them do. They can't go to Uber. Mm. So, you know, actually the whole taxi industry around the world is, is being exploded and it's being rebuilt. There's a guy in Montreal that just bought Diamond Taxi. He's uh, one of the uh, Dragon's Den, uh, or I do say Dragon in French. I don't know. He's oh, the, I don't know. Jay? Jay, how do you say it? He's Dragon! I thought so. He's <laughs> Dragon. The, the Dragon. <laughs> anyway, he was a guy on the Dragon's Den and he just bought uh, the 40 or 50% of the Montreal cab business. Um, and he's planning on replacing all the cars with electric cars, putting taxi drivers on salary, just disrupting it again, and offering a premium level of service. So, you know, you got Uber, you got that kind of idea, you still have the old taxi model. Everything's up in the air, we'll see what happens. But I do think that if I had a plate, uh, I would get together other taxi drivers and demand some form of compensation, because government's behind it. I, I, you know what? I, I would have never thought about that. I'm not just saying this because, because you know, you're on the show. Yeah, yeah, I help sponsor the show. I, 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 I see it from that human level now, and it, and it makes sense to me. And I think it's, uh, I think it's a very fair statement that you bring up. Um, I'll still probably take Uber though. That's you know because that's how, where they get you. Because the regular citizens aren't. It's it's going to be hard to back that that kind of support because we're saving hundreds of dollars a year. Well, U- Uber's here to stay. Yeah. So I. Can 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 the at least the cabs can they can they 
do up their cars like NASCARs? They can really advertise them at least. Can they? <laughs> well, they do that in in, um, in uh, Las Vegas to an obscene level, right? Okay. I mean, everything's wrapped. It's mostly strip clubs. But, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, they could do that. Sure. I mean, there, there's the city. Uh, the city won't allow. I, I would imagine in the legislative industry that it is that they can't do that on their own without city permission. I would say they have to oh, get I a see. partnership with the city to do it, and the city would have to make a piece of that probably. Uh, Brad's hanging out with us. You, you see any good movies lately? You know what? I, I went to Sausage Party the other night, and it's, fuck, it is so funny. <laughs> see? It's so completely uh, filthy, and, I mean, they attack every group. <laughs> I love the dialogue between the Arab guy and the Jewish bagel. Have you seen it? I haven't seen it. Oh, this is like a, what's the Arab bread? It's like lafka, laf, lava? Jay? I, I don't know. Like it, 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 it's me. a droopy kind of lavish. Lavish? Uh, yeah, okay. Anyway. Well, so I, I have to interrupt, right? Sorry. Uh, I, I'm, I, Lewis, don't ever try and correct Brad J. Lamb. It's okay. Lewis, <laughs> Lewis the intern. Like, don't even, don't, it's all right. Don't even, don't even. Yeah, anyway, it's just they, they, they share an aisle, you know, like, so it's like the whole conflict in, in the Middle East between uh, like, Arabs and Jews, and it's just the, so Woody Allen kind of voice is the bagel, and I don't know who the, the the Arab guy is, but it's just it's it's just awful how he goes after every group, but it works, it works, and it's it's there's some there's some actually thought provoking things in it too. It's a bit existential in your in in how the you know they're portraying our place in the world and who are we and why why are we alive and and they do it with these. You know, you know, hot dogs and buns and stuff, and the hot dogs want to fuck the buns. <laughs> and there's all crazy sexual entendres with that. It's very, very funny. Funniest movie I've seen in a long time. Oh, good to know. I'm yeah. gonna go check it out. And uh, yeah, Seth Seth Rogen continues to to impress. It's, Brad, so, it's so filthy. You gotta yeah. really you gotta see it. So. Brad gives that two cloned <laughs> thumbs up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thumb, thumbs and toes, man. Are you chilling watching the Olympics? Uh, yeah, yeah, I watched, uh, I mean, Usain Bolt's amazing, right? Oh, Do you know that, man. I didn't realize this, but when he was 19, he was in the, in the uh, uh, so what Olympics would that have been, 2000? When did he win the, was it 2004? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so he was in the 2000 Olympics as a 19-year-old, and he didn't get into the finals. No, I had no I, idea. I just heard that last night, yeah. Wow, and that you, you start to think what Andre de Grasse just did sorry, at, at twenty one. He was yeah. a seventeen year old. Seventeen. Seventeen. He was twenty one in the next Olympics. Okay. Yeah, he was because he's twenty. He's thirty one now, I think. Or, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's a remarkable, remarkable story. Yeah, yeah. He, he's jogging. He just he's he, just yeah. so wildly fast. It's it's like, why isn't there anyone else six foot five that can run like that? It's it's pretty bizarre. And how's his last name Bolt? It really. <laughs> Perfect name. Like, come on. Yeah. Did someone give him that name? I always wanted to Google that. Is that actually Jay Do you know? Is that I a wrestling name? His, no, I no don't Vince know. McMahon didn't give it to him? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's he's amazing. Like he's just so fast. Phelps has amazing. won what, twenty eight gold medals now entirely? No, uh, I think twenty three gold and five assorted others. I see. It, yeah. Is would you say he's the best Olympian of all time? Um I mean swimming's you know, <laughs> No, no, I, 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 was, I used to swim competitively, okay. so I, I know. know it's a brutal sport, man. Okay. The training is like hours by yourself in the pool. You want to put a gun to your head, it's tough. Uh -huh. um, but it, but the only thing I'd say is that it's grueling and it's difficult, but um, you swim, I don't know. It, it, it is, no one's come anywhere close to that medal count. He's a remarkable yeah. individual. Leave it at that. It's, it is, and the Canadian, I can't remember her name, won four medals this Olympics. That's the fantastic Oh, yeah, the, the, uh, the 16 year old female yeah, who's insane. doing amazing. Yeah, that's a really good story. So, so I mean, it's, do, you, do you believe in the spirit and the inspiration and the, you know, the, the unification of, of what the Olympic Games symbolize? Do you, do, you, do, you, do you like that? Yeah, I'm not sure that's true, but I, I think I, uh, the Olympic Games is a, is a, for the athletes, I think it represents that, but I think for uh, the body that runs it, it's just money. Right. Money, yeah, they, they, uh, they're they investigating an executive. I was reading a story about this today for Scott. Like the European IOC executive, the big one, is getting investigated or had, was arrested or is about to get arrested for scalping tickets. Yeah, 71 year old dude. I saw oh that my too. God, man. He's, come on. Really? They're not paying you enough to be a, you know. an executive of the IOC. You have yeah. to scalp tickets. Like, what is yeah. he on the corner? <laughs> Does it bother you? We were chatting about this a little bit yesterday. Um, 
does it bother you? And it's, it always goes back to kind of the divide between the rich and the poor and stuff and how many millions and hundreds of millions of dollars and sponsorship dollars and all this kind of stuff going into the Olympic Games. And then right across the road, there's so much poverty. Is there, is there, is. Yeah. I mean, that, so, you know, that is a problem, but, but I'll say this, a lot of, uh, so w w what do these athletes provide society? So they provide society something to aspire to be, right? And the human condition is tough. It's it's hard to be happy. It, it's it's difficult um, to be successful. It's it's you know, and it's it's a cruel world, really. And so anything that can um, help raise people above that and see what you know how what greatness is, and and that's why seeing someone like Michael Phelps for Olympics, you know what he's cut, what he's done is inspiring, and 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 you know uh, anyone who dedicates their entire life to one thing like that. It's inspiring. And by the way, you know, some guys like Michael Phelps and Usain Bolt make lots of money, but you know, the high jumper just won a gold medal. That guy's not making any money. He might, I mean, he might be on the, the box of Canadian Wheaties this year, but you know, those guys don't make a lot of money. For, for especially for the commitment they put into yeah, it. Yeah, massive commitment to be the best in the world. So I, I, I think it's a great thing. I think it's great for the athletes. I think that it's, and I think it's great for people. I think that it's unfortunate the people that run these organizations are largely corrupt. That's too bad. So crooked. Did you see the high jumper who, who uh, or the pole vaulter or whatever hit the hit the uh, that that bar on top with his dick? Did you see that? No. He was, he was the best. Did you see that, Jay? They slow it down. I saw. Yeah, it's he was, he's literally going for like a medal, and then his dick hit the thing. Like you can see. Did you see that, Roddy? The guy's the, the Olympian whose dick he jumps over. Jay's gonna pull this up. It's hard. I, I have to say dick to describe it because you can't see it because we're on the radio. But it's a it's like it's absolutely hilarious. He just got very excited, and we're showing it to Brad right now. If you haven't. Yeah, I mean, so, this is just footage. Like, yeah. Try and find the video. Anyway, yeah. they slow it down. It literally is like Dick hits the pole, and and then he 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 got uh, well, was he, didn't he make it. excited? Yeah, <laughs> he's like, I've never been this high. I'm gonna get a medal. I'm gonna get a medal. It's so exciting. So, so in the end, what happened? Did he did he win a medal? Or? I don't think he did. Was it the last vault for uh, him? Here we go. Here, watch Brad, and then here we go. Oh, oh he's flying. Yeah, Look at his right. face. Yeah. Look at his face. Yeah. Oh my god, that's the, the face of a man whose penis just hit a pole vault. Oh, okay. it, it, that's what that's what knocked the pole down. His yeah. legs didn't do it, it was his penis. I bet you he just that's it. I, I don't even believe I think he did this on purpose just so he had something to show the ladies, you know. It's a great Timmy yeah. profile pick. Like my penis is so strong it cost me an Olympic gold medal. <laughs> Uh, Brad J. Lamb, thank you always for coming by and hanging out with You're us, welcome. man. And just um, you always have a, re a really neat spin on 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 questions. It's it's it, you open up our minds. It's nice. Thanks, thank you. dude. Yeah, we're gonna hang out one day. What car are we going for, Ryan? Uh, any car you like. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I love this guy, uh, Brad J. Lamb. Go to TorontoCondos.com. Uh, great investments. Look for condominiums. Look for homes and developments all across Canada. Uh, and tons of stuff, mortgage companies. He's got it all going on. Uh, it's easy to find um, and, and um, easy, torontocondos.com. The Todd Shapiro Show. Turn up your speakers, especially if you're over 65. Sirius XM 168, Canada Laughs.